Every episode of The Gage is brought to you by Bill Fick Ford and the WCRA. Guys, Bill Fick Ford is the number one Super Duty dealer in the country for the fourth year in a row. You guys have heard me rant and rave about Bill Fick Ford for the absolute best buying experience in the car industry, truck industry. Bill Fick Ford's the place to go. I bet you remember the old ad where I said I was getting a new Super Duty. Well, here's the keys for that. Bill Fick Ford delivers, guys. Noble discounts, noble interest rates, the best buying experience you can get. And if you are not local to Huntsville or the Houston area, he'll deliver it to you just like he did to me. Bill Fick Ford. Rodeo Corpus Christi has nearly tripled its added prize money from 2019 and will be one of the largest payout rodeos this summer. That's $545,000 with no entry fees. Rodeo Corpus Christi will be the first stop of WCRA's Triple Crown of Rodeo. The only way to qualify for the Rodeo Corpus Christi is by nominating your rides and runs with the WCRA. You can win $1 million by nominating your rides and runs and earning points with the WCRA. Through the Triple Crown of Rodeo, the WCRA will award this $1 million cash prize to any one athlete or collective of athletes who win first place at any three consecutive WCRA major rodeos. A common misconception with the WCRA is that it is only for the pros. That's the farthest thing from the truth. It's designed for the underdogs to have their fair chance if you feel like you have the ability to compete against the best in the world. But maybe you don't feel like it. Maybe you can't afford to go down the road for a full year. Maybe you got a job. Well, the WCRA is made for you. The WCRA has awarded more than $8.5 million to rodeo athletes in just a couple of years. To learn more, visit WCRARodeo.com and learn how you can earn a spot at Rodeo Corpus Christi and possibly be Rodeo's next millionaire. The saying we wake up and we live it every day is, it's not just a saying, it's, it's true. We think we have limits and, and we push ourselves to those limits and then we realize we can go farther. We uh, wake up, put our pants and boots on and put our belt and buckle on and then we squash our hat down on our head and we go on. Everybody's got a different style of cowboy hat, a different color, a different shape. It really fits your personality and makes you who you are. What's underneath that hat and what's in your heart as a cowboy is what really matters. It's full send and, and no back down, so we really do live it every day. This is The Gage with host Chance Conradu. Are you freaking serious? It's Conrado. This is The Gage and I am Chance Conrado. On this episode of the podcast, we have got the Navajo son, Derek Begay, eight-time Wrangler National Finals qualifier in the team roping. I have been wanting to get Derek on the show for a long time tried a lot of different things to get him here and he basically said no only if the stars align well they finally did align he happened to be in town and we made it happen i think you guys will get a lot out of this podcast i really really like Derek, and he might be one of my one of my favorite people in rodeo um just because he's super inspirational and where he came from it's just a really really cool guy so check it out you do a mic check one two three mic check one two three yeah sounds perfect he's a man made for the microphone yeah, they're going to get you on Cowboy Channel doing what Trevor does. You're going to replace him. <laughs> Trevor, he sold a horse for, what, 250 last night? Yeah, Same. yeah, pretty wild. It's like he could do whatever he wants. Well, I will say, Derek, you are a man of your word. When we talked, when was that last time we talked? A little, it's been a while ago. October? Yep. September? Mm-hmm. And uh, you said if you were in the right place at the right time, that you'd come on the show and you did exactly yeah. what you said. Well, I guess you forgot about the American and how that would kind of all time perfectly <clears throat> being right down the street. Yeah, I did. I, well, you know, it's one of those, I think it's one of those deals. Like I think I knew what I was talking about, but getting into the American being a qualifier and stuff is pretty tough. So yeah, the chances of being here was pretty slim. So I did say that for that reason thinking yep. I wasn't, you know, 
it was kind of a kind of a nice way of saying no, I didn't want to do it. Uh huh. But if I'm here in town, I would do it. Yep. So. Yep. Okay, I think, you know, Ty, I threw I threw everything. It's like, hey, we'll fly out. I'll even fly somebody there to drive you from your house to the airport, if you'll come on the show. Yeah, you did. You yep. did say all that. Everything was lined up for me to go, but. Yep. And you said no, thank you. Well, I, said, I would rather I would rather sit on a rattlesnake than talk to you on a microphone. <laughs> Those are your exact words. No, that's probably the most thing I was scared of is a snake, especially a rattlesnake. Really? Yep. But this microphone is probably second. <laughs> <laughs> I was surprised after you did the thing on Vice. You were so well spoken. You did a good job. I was surprised to hear that. You got a lot to say. I mean, all your interviews. It's more than three words. Well, yeah. <laughs> You actually you have that in common with my brother in law. He does not like to speak either. Yeah, I kind of noticed that. I kind of like, I like that. You like Billy because you guys can just look at each other and know you don't <laughs> have to speak at all. <laughs> yeah, that's a good thing. I rode with him a few times, and I don't think we ever spoke to every other than you want to rope, or then after we get done, it's thanks for roping. That's it. <laughs> uh, uh, that's exactly right with Billy. It doesn't matter. He could uh, he could win anything at all, and he's gonna be like, "Yep, time mm-hmm. to go back to Oklahoma." Well, I am actually really excited to have you here out of pretty much everybody we've had on the show. You know, I was telling a lot of people that I really want to talk to Derek just because I find everything about you to be pretty inspirational. I know that's, you probably get sick of hearing that, but uh, I think your whole journey is is really what I maybe I want to talk about. I know it's been talked about before, but not in this setting, in this format, and with the amount of people who are going to listen to it. I mean, you are... When you come from the background you come from and, and do what you do, I mean, I know you've been hearing it for a decade, but I mean, what is that? What is that like, you know, growing up where you grew up? And it, it's really interesting for me because, you know, my grandma is 50% Pawnee Indian and it just the way she talks about her childhood, her mom's childhood, it didn't seem at least what she was telling me that they had a whole lot of hope to do many big things. Yeah, it's... You know, it's, I don't know what it is, if it was meant to be or if it was destiny or if it was just, I don't know, it's probably all the above, but it's still, still to this day, it's one of those deals that, you know, you always, I remember one day thinking of trying to be who I'm trying to be, you know, be a professional team roper. And I thought about winning certain events or qualifying for the NFR stuff, but it was always one of those wild dreams where you think about it and you want to do it and you want to be that guy but then you also think realistically like no a guy like me probably doesn't have a chance to do something like that so that's how it kind of always been but now to actually kind of live it out it it is kind of neat just to just to do it the way you know the way I come where I come from and how I did it and there's a personal story behind it it's kind of neat yeah yeah i mean when you were growing up i mean we should we should talk about that story that's what's great about this forum is like you're not limited to 15 seconds after a win or or a 10 minute thing i mean we have actually some time to kind of talk about your your background which i think is what would really be interesting to people who maybe don't know who maybe don't follow team roping or they'll know they know who you are obviously but maybe they don't know know who you are so i mean what what was your childhood like you know when you were in your formative years to try to get to the, like, obviously you've said many times that you picked up a rope as a little kid, but in detail. Yeah. Well, um, I was born and raised on a, the Navajo reservation. It's north of Winslow, Arizona, about 50 miles. There's a little community called Seba Del Cai, Arizona. It's right there on the reservation. And uh, mom, dad, I have an older sister. I have a younger sister. And uh, just grew up there living on the reservation. My grandparents, they always had cows, horses, sheep, stuff always around. So, and then my, my family, they all got a background in rodeo. That's what they always kind of did. So it was something that just grew up around and it, it was always there. So I don't know if it grew on me or if, if it was just something that was meant to be, but I mean, we kind of grew up uh, not with all the, I mean, I had every chance to do what I kind of do, but I think having the sources was pretty limited 
on just becoming of becoming what I want to become. The sources were limited, but my mom, my dad, they kind of did everything they could to provide the most they could to kind of help me on uh, my wild dream or my passion or something. So they they did what they could. They I don't know, tried to have a horse around there where I could ride and something to rope and it wasn't easy the the way we were brought up and and stuff like that but it's i don't know it's like i said at the time thinking about feels like i've i've actually someone now and actually accomplished something but before that it was it felt like i didn't have a chance a chance to do what i want to do but then i don't know what it was but it worked out when you're when you're a kid growing up on the reservation, I mean, you're eight years old, nine years old, ten years old, whenever it is where you're starting to have these thoughts about, you know, what's life going to look like as an adult, I and mean, what is that like for most kids? Because, I mean, most people can't relate to, to that. They just don't know. They don't understand. Um. Well, <laughs> when I was that young, I wasn't really thinking about life either. It was just roping. But it seems like, I don't know what it is, but growing up on the reservation, it seems like we're already kind of we already have a sort of a setback i don't know if it's just something that that is said to us or something that we're we kind of somebody made us believe that so i always feel like i had a like starting from behind or starting from like it seems like i always had to work harder or it was always harder to get something done just from being there from the reservation, which to look back on it now, I don't think it was, I think what I guess what I'm trying to say is if I can do it, I think anybody else from the reservation can do it because I had probably the same amount of resources and same amount of limitabilities that anybody else had on their reservation. So it's, it's, yeah. Yeah. I mean that I get that, but when you're, when you're going through it, right? And when is it that, like, at what age specifically was it where you were like, man, I think pro rodeo is the route. Like, obviously you rodeo and did all that, but there's a lot of steps you have to take that maybe if you're a, a kid who grows up in Texas, like, you know, there's a very defined path. Like, you know who to talk to. Everybody's super accessible, but where you were at, that's not the case. <laughs> well, I, for, yeah, like for me, for having a, a chance for being a professional rodeo cowboy or having a chance to make the finals. I do, I do. I don't really remember at any certain time where I felt like I was good enough to be going or good enough to enter. I, I never really felt that until later on in my life, probably, I don't remember what year it was. I think it was, yeah, no, I exactly know what year it is. 2006 is when I finally knew, I felt like I had a chance to, to accomplish what I want to. I remember it was in uh, 2000, 2000, no, 2007 is when I first started. Let's hear, let's go back. Yep, 2007, this is when uh, they have a big roping in San Antonio. It's called the George Strait Roping, and you get to enter with three partners. And I remember I was at home at a little jackpot roping over there, and friend of mine, his name is Cesar De La Cruz. He rode up beside me. He's like, hey, you want to go enter the George Strait Roping? It's like, in my, in my, I was like, in my mind, I was shaking my head. No, I, not good enough to go there. I can't afford to go there. But someone inside of me said, yeah, I'll go. So I got to enter with Cesar and I got another guy, his, his uncle, his name is Victor Eros. I got those two and he said, hey, I got a guy that will pay your fees. It was like $500 a man. So that's what I did. I went to the George Strait Roping. And we got there and we went through the qualifying rounds and stuff. And I did good with Caesar enough to get to the next round. But anyway, we ended up winning like uh, $15,000, $16,000 a man at that roping. And that's what kind of really gave me a boost gave me the confidence and kind of gave me the money. The bad part about 
that deal was the guy paid my fees and he paid it for half. Mm-hmm. So, so you had to give him half. <laughs> I had to give him half back, which was 7500 And I kept the other 7500 which I was still pretty happy about it. And then about a month later, they had another rope in Las Vegas, Nevada. It's called the Hork Dog. Charlie Horky puts that on. And I went there again and same two partners and end up winning the rope. And, and then I end up winning $21,000, man. That was the biggest win by far. And the craziest part about it is how the guy paid my fees again. <laughs> I had to give him 10 5 again. That was the last day I had somebody pay my fees, though. But <laughs> but that stuff kind of, that's those are the two ropings that kind of gave me the boost. Like, confidence-wise, felt like my horse was good enough, felt like I roped good enough, and I finally had some money to do some. So after that, I bought my car. That was probably in April. I bought my PRSA car. And then uh, I planned to rope with the guy. His name was Victeros. This was in 2007. So we, I bought my car, and the first rodeo we entered was in Guyman, Oklahoma. And then from there, we went on. We place here and there we started having a pretty good summer we got to Cheyenne and then we won second the first round at Cheyenne so I was like man I got some money won I remember we we're on our way to another road here we we're spending some time in Blackfoot Idaho I remember going to Blackfoot Idaho to the public library and uh walked inside I got a little public library card had to fill out my information the reason I was well going there is because I wanted to check the standings, the pro order standings. You're trying and, to get on the computer? Yep, trying <laughs> to get on the computer. So I went in there, I checked in the library, sat down on the computer, actually W typed in like www.proordeo.com and <laughs> went all the way to the standings. And I looked at it and I was 21st. I was like, wow. That day was the first day I knew like, hey, I got a chance to, I mean, my ultimate dream was to make the finals like hey i have a chance to make the finals i was 21st so i seen that that's the day i knew like hey this ain't as hard as i i think it was or i made it to be out like it's not impossible so that's the that's the day i knew like hey this is i have a chance to do this and i want to try to do it and i mean after that it, my name dropped from the standings after that but 21st <laughs> was the highest i ever seen it Anyway, I went down, went down. I didn't, we didn't finish the year very good. Ended up not making it. So when the next year in 2008, we started the year from the beginning and it was rough here and there, but we ended up making the finals in 2008. So that's where kind of my dream came true or started or whatever you call it. Why do you, what do you think was the biggest like determining factor in you thinking that like it wasn't achievable? Just based on you knew how much it took to get there, money, you see? I don't know what it, I don't know, well, just, I think living at home and and just staying close to home and just seeing the little I could, like in the newspapers or whatever they had that on TV, like they used to show the NFR and stuff, like it was just like they did that in another world almost, like that was for certain kind of people that, like it was just just for them and I was over here at home not thinking like hey it, that's that's not for me almost like like guys like me don't have a chance to do what they're doing I don't nobody ever told me that or anything like that but it was just is uh, that the is that the mentality that most people on the reservation have like they just just because of the whole way, I mean, if you're getting into history at all, like I really do, especially Native American stuff, because it's just, it's just a crazy thing if you look into it. Even if you're tied to it minorly like I am, you just want to know, right? And, yeah. And understand it. And you hate it, right? Because you just, you see historically kind of what happened there and why maybe that mindset exists on the reservations. Because it, it's just the whole thing is, and you try to say it tactfully, right? Yeah. But it, it reality is reality, right? Like yeah. that's, that's the truth that this thing was set up and it's almost like native American people, the native American people who are native to this country are meant to feel like, or set up in a situation where they can't succeed. Like the people who came here after 
Isn't it weird when you think about it that way? Yeah, it is. I think that's I think that's what the case was. But that that was really what the case was. It's just it seems like we're they set us back which now to think back and look at it but but no that's not the case. I think to me being from the reservation I think is is a good thing. I I think that's what helped me get to be who I am and do what I do and I think there's a lot there's way more positives coming from the reservation than people look think about or or put themselves already behind the already behind their goals and stuff but to look back at it now I'm glad I'm from the reservation and I did it that way and I think there's a lot of benefits coming from where I did and stuff like that so but back to your question I there, there to think about it I think there is kids and people that live on the reservation now already just have that mindset like you know what I can't do that I can't be that guy or I can't be that girl I th- I think that's a common case on the reservation and I mean whoever's out here listening uh, that's not true I I think we actually have what do you call it we actually have I think we have a pretty good that's a pretty good place to be for whatever you're trying to do it's a you know it's a good place to grow up I think yeah yeah I mean if you're able to because it just seems like the whole family thing, like that's something that's kind of not so much in our industry, right? Because we're, it's different. Rodeo's different. But like in, in the regular world, if you want to call it that, because we're, we're a subculture that's isolated from the rest of the world almost, it feels like. But in, in the regular world, family is just, it's starting to not be as important maybe. Like if you look at mainstream stuff, it's like everything's about denigrating the family and that doesn't happen where you're from. Yeah, no, I mean, my family's, Probably this is the only reason why I do it. I mean, I couldn't have done it without him. But in my family, we're all pretty close together, and we all try to help each other and stuff. So th- that's that's how the reservation is. People are all a big family, and everybody's closely related, and it's a small circle and stuff. And I think that's all a bonus. Yeah. And fast forwarding, I'm going to fast forward and then we're going to rewind. But is that why, like when you decided you, after your eighth trip to the NFR, you were like, okay, I think I'm going to more or less retire from beating the pavement hard and go back home. Is that like, you never wanted to go anywhere else. You always wanted to live in that, live there, right? Even though maybe you had opportunities, you could have lived probably anywhere you want after all of that, but you wanted to go home. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. When I was younger, I didn't want to be home. Yeah. You know, I took the first ride out of town and took the last one home. <laughs> <laughs> Nowadays it's different. It's hard for me to leave home. I can uh, attest to that. I tried to get you to leave home. Yeah. I think that's just, <laughs> it's just the way the, I guess it's weird how the table turns, but yeah, I think I grew up in reservation and I'd done what I want to do. And I got to see some of the coolest places in the United States, mostly the Western side of it Been to the, some of the nicest places, the nicest homes, met the, met, made a lot of friends and met a lot of families and stuff like that. But there ain't no place like home or in the reservation. And yeah, I have it. I mean, a person has a chance to kind of live anywhere they want to or take a vacation wherever they want to be. But Arizona is a place for me and I don't think that'll ever change. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, I, I'll never forget talking to you like there's no way I could do a podcast and we talked on the phone for like an hour I was like well you kind of just did one what if I send a driver and you're like nope nope no way in hell you probably (laughs) didn't say that but no way I'm doing it okay now the time to rewind and kind of go back when you first like when you first started to go what was it like entering those rodeos and being around all these people you'd never been around and and this this thing that you'd never been around like at the big rodeos or whatever that big roping um, the George Strait was, what was it like, like for you to go and you see all these people, you see these huge rigs, you see these giant living corridors and freight liners and just the things you see at big ropings and rodeos that if you're from the reservation, you probably don't see a lot of that. Yeah. It's when I first started and I mean, there's that intimidating feelings always being there. Like, Hey, do I belong here? 
I'm not going to fit in. I mean, these people live a different lifestyle than I do. I'm kind of the only guy that's out here from the reservation, and I didn't have no friends, no whatever. But So it, it was, you know, just showing up at different places. It was awkward, and, you know, I kind of was embarrassing myself, I guess, you know, of the rig I drove, the horse I rode, or maybe the look I had. So <laughs> I didn't really want to stick my head out there too much. I kind of stayed to myself and kind of snuck around the back a little bit. But nothing's changed. I'm still that way. But <laughs> but it is. It's just that out-of-place feeling. It'll make a guy not feel like he's supposed to be there and stuff. But I didn't. I never let. I never let it get get to me too much. So, but yeah, yeah it, it, it is. Sense. It gets intimidating. Like the rigs nowadays. Like mine was never that way, and it still isn't. And the horses I ride are. I, I guess it's the big part is the money part. We never had that and still don't. So feels like those guys got an edge on me or those guys feel like can do more than I can do. But, but to think about it now, it's that none of that really matters the way you look or where you're from or what you drive or what you ride. They can make fun of you, talk about you all you want, but it's at the end of the day, it's just about doing your job, I guess. So it is, it is neat to look back and think about it, though. Yeah, I mean, I find it to be pretty, pretty fascinating because you just you get to see so much in rodeo. But I mean, that's probably the number one excuse, like that you'll hear people who don't come from, I can call it a lavish background is, well, there's just no way, you know, I can't get a horse like that. I can't uh, get a rig. I can't do this for, I mean, I've said that myself many times. It's a, it's an excuse. And then you look at a Derek Begay and you're like, well, hang on a second. If this dude did it, then just like what you said, I mean, anybody could probably do it. Now, granted, you're extremely talented and that's some people can't throw a rope like that, even if they tried for their whole life, but to be able to push all those feelings down and, and, like still persevere through it. I think that's, that's probably the main reason I wanted to talk to you is because I just think it's really inspirational story. Now, granted, I know you've said it a bunch, but it's just, it's different in this format, at least for me. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of memories about the hard, the hard times, the times I struggled and stuff like that. Those, those, those are easy to overlook when you have all the good moments and the times you win and stuff. But I still remember all the times I've wondered how I was going to get to the next one or what I was going to do or how I was going to do it and or figured out, like, man, I need a little better horse or how I was going to get it and stuff. And all those things all worked out somehow, some way. And I don't, I don't know. That I don't have an answer for. <laughs> so... I don't know. I mean, there's all kinds of stories. I remember one year I was, what was it at? We got done over in um, Deadwood, South Dakota. I remember one year I was rodeo. This was when I made the finals a couple times already and stuff, and I was at Deadwood, South Dakota, and we're on our way to Cheyenne. It was like third high call at Cheyenne. Roped at Deadwood, and I was rodeo with a good friend of mine, Turtle Pal. We left Deadwood, and we're on our way to Cheyenne. I checked my bank account. I had $42 in there. <laughs> I'm like, man, which I knew I was running out of money and stuff. And we got to uh middle of Deadwood and Cheyenne. There's a little town there in Wyoming, and it was my turn to put fuel in. And I knew I didn't have $42 in I lied to my traveling partner and told him, hey, my, for some reason there's something wrong with my car. You're, you're going to have to get this one. <laughs> <laughs> so Turtle, being a good guy, he didn't care. He's like, yeah, I got you. Still to this day, I haven't told him that <laughs> I was out of money. <laughs> I don't ever tell anybody I'm out of money ever. <laughs> even my partner, even no one, just because it's a, it's an uncomfortable feeling when you're in a rig with somebody that doesn't have money and they say, hey, I'm out. 
but I don't ever tell no one. I keep it all to myself. So I lied to him and told him my car doesn't work, so he put in fuel. Got to Cheyenne, and we got there in the evening time, and we went to Texas Roadhouse to act like I had money. <laughs> anyway, we ate a steak, and our bill was $38. And I said, you know what? I'll pay for it. <laughs> I paid $38 and I tipped the rest of the 42 what I had in my, my bank account. The next day in Cheyenne was a short round Sunday afternoon. Man, it's... End up winning Cheyenne. <laughs> just, just, just stuff like that. It's, it's crazy how... I don't know. Things worked out somehow for some reason. What if it didn't? Yeah. I mean, it could have went the other way. I couldn't probably be here or it's just it's crazy how things like that happen for some reason i don't know yeah well i mean and even like a lot of people would want to quit before they got to that that point right at anything not just rodeo and you hear these stories in rodeo because it's actually it's common but uh to push and push and push and not win and not win or go over the fourth run and not win a dang thing spend all that money (laughs) traveling all over the map and then you know not everybody but some people i mean you're out. I mean, I come from that that family. My sister's got those same stories. Lots yeah, of them. I've got those stories. My dad has those. I mean, it's a common thing, but yeah, it's it's. it's I do like funny. I do like that you were honest about that. Oh, turtle's probably gonna call in that. He's probably gonna call it. Hey, why didn't you tell me to have the money? Like, no, I ain't gonna tell you. It's anytime you were someone in the rig and you know they're out of money, it's kind of you can kind of feel sorry for them and you kind of you didn't want them to feel sorry for you. Yeah, no, <laughs> no. But that was I had that story come up. I just thought about it, but there's plenty of those kind when you go to 60 70 rodeos a year it's just bound to happen yeah there's another one another <laughs> story <laughs> that was like you said a rodeo over the fourth one year this was when me and caesar were fixing to kind of get done roping rodeo the whole fourth july didn't win nothing shared in wyoming saturday night didn't do nothing sunday morning it was time to go to napa or go home i called caesar like hey i'm gonna go home can't go to napa out of money, man. I was, uh, I would 2700 to the PRCA <laughs> from the whole 4th of July and stuff. I was like, man, I can't go no more. I'm done, Caesar. I'm going to go home. You can do whatever you want to do, but I can't go no more. As soon as I got off the phone with him, uh, um, Sherry Service dad, Mel Potter, called me first uh, just to check on me. He'd check on me every now and then, like, hey, how you doing? Like, I'm good, man. I'll just, I'm thinking about going home, blah, blah, blah. I told him the rough story. He's like, no, you better not. You better keep on going. I told him, I said, no, this is what's happening. He said, he said, hold up. I'll call up there right now. I said, no, don't do it. He calls up there. He puts 3000 on my account. So he said, you better go to Napa. <laughs> just, just stuff like that. Anyway, we end up doing pretty good from there and up making the finals and stuff like that but just just stories like that it's kind of i guess to, it's been a while since i thought about those i, I guess you're getting them out of me <laughs> i i never like i told him like hey don't don't tell no one mel i said i'll he said uh whenever you win pay me back he said no what just pay me back in the fall so when i got done rodeo and i Went all the way to his house and gave him his three thousand back. Hand delivered it to him. Yep. But I mean, like all those stories, one thing I'm kind of I don't know proud about, or I never, you know, I never really had to borrow money or had to get a credit card or or had a money guy or. Never had no one had to buy me a horse or no one had to buy me rig or, or stuff like that. So, like, I mean, I had the sponsors to kind of get me down the road here and there, but that's one thing I'm kind of, I mean, you don't have to have the big money guys or you don't have to have someone buy you a horse or you don't have to have someone buy you a rig. Yeah, those things are nice, but you can go, go without it. And like you said, a lot of people use money for an excuse which Definitely is, lack of money. Which is, I mean, yeah, money makes the world go round, and that's what you need to get down the road. But I always say, like, for me, like, money's never been a problem because I never had any. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. I think if you can just, 
I think if you know what you want to do and you want to do it, there's a always a way to figure out how to get it done. And luck does sure help too. And that's also been on my side. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just I find it interesting. Do you think that you didn't want people like, I know I'm kind of picking here, but do you think you didn't want people to know that you were having money problems? Cause you didn't want like another thing for them to. No, it's just, well, it just makes, like I said, it's somebody uncomfortable around you. They, they want to help you and do this and do that for you. And, Cause yeah. I met, I bet you had to turn down a lot of help. Like people, I'm sure people offered. Since you start winning, you start getting phone calls. Uh, well, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. But it's crazy how expensive it is out here to rodeo, especially nowadays. It's like people have got these. I mean, a trucks cost is seventy, ninety thousand, and you got a trailer that costs a hundred and. I don't know how people can afford to do it. It's, I guess I'm doing it the wrong way. I don't know. Yeah. But I try to spend as light as I can and save as much as I can, but I can never do that. But, you know, I was talking to Fallon the other day in here and uh, Fallon Taylor, and she made a really interesting point that I don't know if maybe a lot of people, especially younger people realize is that everything costs a lot more. But she said she went back from when she was rodeo when she was a kid in the early 90s pro rodeo and and looked at like her checks from San Antonio and Houston and not Houston because they bumped that up, but like San Antonio and some other rodeos. And she said they were like two, three hundred dollar differences. So the prize money hasn't went up nearly. There's more stuff, right? You have the American, you have the WCRAs, obviously 50 at Houston and all that. But it. uh, When you. Put it that way. Trucks and trailers were like a quarter of the cost back then, but the prize money. Because I was down, yeah. I was like, "Oh yeah, but everybody's making way more money now." And she's like, "No, no, we no, we aren't." No. I got a whole book full of my old checks and new checks, and they're like two, three hundred, maybe a thousand dollar difference is all from when yeah. she was going as a 13, 14 year old kid. Yeah, I can see that. I can see them paying the same. It, to think about it, yeah, I bet, I bet it, nothing's really changed. I mean, other than maybe the NFR. NFR, that mu- the round money went up big time since those days. But I don't know. I, I try not to get any get into. I don't really ask any about the, anybody about their financial situations. But <laughs> I think I'm doing it wrong because they got the fancy rigs and this and that. I'm like, dang, how can a guy rodeo and pay for that? Right. I just don't see that. I know. I, well, I guess win. I guess. Yeah, win, 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 win. But. I mean, you're you're a guy who's been in the national finals eight times. I mean, you've certainly won a lot. Yeah, I don't know where it went, but you know, one of the funny things I like you'll see if if you read up on you or you look at anything for whatever reason is people would talk about your paint horse that you had, like your slow paint horse or what have you. What what was the story behind that paint horse? I mean, mm, well, <laughs> I guess he's the one that started everything. I have an uncle, his name's Aaron Begay. He bought a couple of paint horses over at a sale in Clovis, New Mexico. I think they, I can't remember if they went for 650 piece or 650 for both of them. But he brought them by one day and said he wanted me to ride them. I loaded this skinny, kind of crooked legged little paint horse that stuck, stuck his tail up. And I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll ride him. So I rode him around the house for, I don't know, a couple of weeks. He was already broke to ride, and he already had a good handle on him. So I had him there, and one day he went to go break in some steers, and I had him with me, and he'd never been in the head box, never did nothing. I rode him in there, and the very first steer, he did really good. I was real surprised. And then he just luckily got better and better, and that's what I started with. And he dang sure wasn't the prettiest he didn't score the best, and we kind of had a love and hate relationship. <laughs> so that's that's. But he's the one that got it all started from. He's the one I won everything with. That George Strait Open, where it kind of started my, felt like started my career. Won the Charlie Charlie Horky's Hork Dog Open. Then that's what I started rodeoing on, and that's what I first made the finals on. So I hate to give that horse a lot of credit, but. He's the one that's kind of done it for me. And I mean, 
he he definitely wasn't the one that he was supposed to do it for me, but I guess he was good enough to do it. So, yeah, he, I owe him a lot of credit, more than I give him. Really? Yep. More than I give him. Do you still have him? Uh, we put him down this past last year in the summer. My dad put him down. He, he called me one day. He said, hey, this paint horse is not doing too good. And it's not. He wasn't getting around like he was supposed to. So took him over the hill, and my dad put him down. So that's, that's what we did. Yeah, but he's, he's the one that kind of started my career, and and, it, and we kept him around for long as much as we could. We tried to use the pet around the house and stuff, so I think he had a pretty good life. He's the one that got me most of the things I got, and so, yep. What Who, who helped you, like? So you got you had that horse, but like who was helping you pick horses, or were you kind of deciding on like, no where, one. Where'd you get your horse sense from? Because that's you know, no one. I'm usually, feel, I I've never grew up around horse trainers, or I never grew up about knowing how to ride one or what bit to use or where to kick one. Or it, it was, I mean, not trying to sound like I'm trying to give myself a lot of credit, but it was mostly self-taught almost. I mean, it was basically me and my dad and my uncles around there, just stuff like that. But I guess just trying to look at the pictures or looking at the few videos we had and stuff like that. But I think I think it was just being around a lot and trying to figure it out and trying to make... I think I'd done it enough where kind of roping kind of came natural, I think. I mean, I never, never been to a roping school or... Never had the fancy dummies or never really had a fancy place to rope or I think it was kind of more just self-taught it feels like to look back at it now but and I think that's why I'm still kind of behind like every now and then you go I'll go to these nice places and be around these really good horsemen and stuff and you get to ask me these questions like wow that that does make a lot of sense I never knew that or whatever so I'm, I'm still learning, but to start off, I felt like I was just thrown in the wind. <laughs> That's what I was doing. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. You kind of got to do it, what you have to do if you don't have access to the those people. I mean, because, like, when I was growing up, I was never, like, allowed to rope until, like, I did a number of things, like, on the horsemanship side. That was just the way that my dad treated us with horses as you got to do a through a through Z basically. And then you can start roping or barrel racing or whatever it is you're going to do with these horses. And, uh, so I just, I found it interesting cause you're kind of just like, I'm going to hop on, I'm going to do this thing. And that's what I wanted to do. And I was like, well, why do I, I don't care about a lead. I don't know what a lead is. I don't care. I don't want to look perfect. <laughs> yeah. What's the point? You're right. Like I yeah. felt like I just learned what a lead was a couple years ago. Yeah. I mean, heck, horses running. Or how, to, or how to look for it, because if you don't know how to look for it, you have no <laughs> idea what they're talking about. Yeah, like, hey, you're in the wrong lead. Like, what do you mean? Yeah, <laughs> stuff like that. I never really knew what it was not till not very long ago. Yeah. I mean, but it goes to show you don't need to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, you know, horse that runs. Yeah, runs and, and, and turns to the left, at least for what you were doing. Horse that draws good. Yeah. You, know, you made it the first time, the second time, all the way eight times to the to the national finals road. You know, at that point, you're one of the most recognizable people in the whole sport, right? When you started getting approached by like these organizations who wanted to talk to you and do stories on you and all that, were you were you as adverse to doing it then as you are now? Uh, what do you mean by that? Like, well, like, I was like, hey. I'm going to do all this stuff. Oh. Bring you out here. Come on, Derek. Let's have a good time. Come to Fort Worth. Let's hang no. out. Let's talk. Let spill your guts. Let's talk about it. And you're like, oh, I don't like doing that stuff. But like when Vice approached you to do that whole, the, the Navajo Sun thing, which is awesome. That's like one of the coolest cinematography things I've seen that they've ever done on rodeo stuff. But how did they approach you? And, and what was your response to, you know, them wanting to do that with you? Well, I mean, when someone asks like that, the first feeling is no. 
Like, no, I, the feeling of being uncomfortable and not wanting to do something is a feeling I don't like. And I've been in a lot of those situations and doing these videos and these interviews and stuff like that. I, I mean, I don't like doing them. But there's also the part of where, you know what, I'm going to be who I want to be and kind of be this. I have to be involved in stuff like this. Or if I want to try to help someone or show somebody else, maybe a kid on the reservation or someone like, hey, I'm going to have to quit thinking like that and sit up in this chair and say some or do some or try to show them some where I can maybe give them some they can look at or let them know like, hey, that that dream that I once had of being a professional cowboy, like I was unrealistic to me, but it's all, it's like it's pretty much saying if a guy like me can do it, you can also. So that's kind of the reason why I do it and stuff like that. So Was that, I mean, what was the first big thing that you got asked asked to do? Open my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> but shoot, I don't know. They, I try to forget about them. But I, I don't know that the one, Yeti's the one that did that one film, The Navajo Sun, and that's kind of the first one. It's it's crazy. I mean, they, I'm not kidding. They probably spent 100000 on that deal. They come over three times. There was a crew of eight, eight to 12 guys. They stayed there for a week or so every time they come. And it's just it's crazy how people like that are willing to put money into something to to help me but then they're also helping their brand. So, I mean, if someone's willing to do something like that, you also have to step up and do your part too. But, so, I, I'm, I like doing them other than the feeling of being uncomfortable. I don't like doing them. <laughs> no, I get it. I mean, you speak well. I don't know why you feel uncomfortable. You tell great stories. But uh, when you decided to quit road, I mean, what was the defining point in your career where you're like, okay, eight times in a far, that's enough. I'm sick of this or, or maybe I just don't feel like doing it. Whatever the reason was that you decided not to go for nine, 10, whatever. What was that exact moment that you realized that and why? No, I, I never said I was going to quit or retire. Yeah. I never said that. It was just, I'm never going to require, I'm never going to retire or I'm never going to quit. I'm going to do as long as I can, but it was, I guess the word would probably be slow down. Yeah. Um, the competition I'm addicted to and I always will be, I I love every bit of that, but the reason I don't want to go as much as I used to is just to travel. That's it. I mean, driving down the road 12 hours during the day or at night, hauling a horse, I mean, pulling into a fuel station two in the morning, putting in fuel, trying to water the horses, eating from the gas station and just, just, just stuff like that. It just, that's the stuff that I don't like. That's the stuff. That's the only reason I don't do it anymore. And home, it's just like, I got some other stuff go- that I want to do at home. I enjoy being around my family, obviously, but I got some cows I kind of built up and stuff like that and it's fun to sleep in your own bed and eat real food and I mean I also have a little girl she's a year and a half and that's I guess answer your your question that's why I kind of want to be home but the competition part it'll always be there if there's a rodeo close by enough and somebody good enough that I feel like I could win with I'm going to enter and I'm going to go and I'm never going to quit. So, but I think just being home and having a family and all those things is what's making me not want to go so much. I mean, that makes sense. I mean, what's, what's it like having a daughter after all that? And I mean, it's kind of late, a, a later in life for you, right? To be having a one-year-old. Yeah. I I don't know. I 
I first started, I never had a plan for nothing. I never planned on when I was going to rodeo, how I was going to do it, how long I was going to do it. I never planned on when I was going to have a kid or it, everything was just kind of come, I think, when it's supposed to, it feels like. Well, did you plan to have the kid or was it a surprise? I mean, it wasn't like, okay, we're going to plan on this right. day and this, that. No. So- you weren't planning for the kid, but you weren't I was wanting, not planning. Well, I was wanting a kid. Yeah. But I didn't plan. <laughs> I don't know how to explain no, that. No, no, we all know how it happens. Yeah. So but yeah, that's seems like everything's So what what is the what is a day in the life of Derek when you're at home now? Checking cows, riding horses. What are you doing? Get up in the morning. My fiance, she's Still sleeping with a little girl most of the time, so I'll get up and have a cup of coffee and start doing chores, I guess. And there's always something to do around there. Seems like I'm busy all the time, but nothing gets done. <laughs> but, I mean, I'm, I don't know what you call it, self-employed, and I got some cows of my own, and I don't really like to use the word, the word ranching. That sounds like I've got it made and feels like I'm successful and stuff and this and that. I... I don't know what you call it, cowboy or I don't know what it's called. But <laughs> ranching sounds cool, and that's feels like I'm not doing that. How many cows is it? What's that? How many cows do you have? I don't like to tell no one that. <laughs> <laughs> some days it feels like a lot, and some days it's not enough. Yeah. But What's your goal? I mean, how many do you want to have? That's a better question. I remember I was watching the PBR. When PBR first kind of came around, this guy won a big bull ride. He won, I don't know, close to 100000 And he asked him, he's like, what do you want to do? What are you going to do with all this money? He's like, I don't know. He said, my dream one day is to have 100, 100 mama cows that are paid for. And I remember that one day. And I was like, you know what? That's my dream too. But I made that dream come true already though. So yeah. that's all I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's... I, I don't know. I enjoy being around cows and I like them. And that's what I do. I probably need a real job, but I just don't got time for one, I guess. Yeah. It's better. I mean, so your entire life has been pursuing your goals and your dreams. Why would you stop now and go get a, a real job? That doesn't <laughs> make any sense. Yeah. I, I don't know. There's times where I felt like I probably should get one and stuff. I, I never had one. Never had never, one? Never ever had a real job ever. Well, that's going to so, make it hard to get one, probably. You better stick with the know. cows. It'll work out for you. You know what to do. I don't know. We'll see. I'm just going to go with whatever comes. Yeah, probably having a kid changes your perspective on a lot of things, yeah. though, right? I always thought my horses were important. And I always thought a cow was the best thing, but nope. Not even close to what a child can do for you. Things sure changes your life. It yeah. did mine. Are you going to have more? You just want the one or do you want a few? Well, I want more, but I'm, it's not going to be planned. It's just going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Derek Begay, no plan even when it's human life. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, I want more. Yeah. Do I like? Do your folks live real close to you? Like, is everybody, like, are you all on the same piece of property? Yeah. Yeah, yeah my mom and dad live about three quarters, about half a mile from my do. Yeah. Do we live? Yeah, how many acres are you guys running these cows on? Well, the res is the biggest reservation in the U.S. Or I mean, the and whole you're world. you're allowed to turn. Forgive me, I don't know all the, like, no, the logistics no. of that. But can you open range on the reservation <laughs> with your cows? Yeah, really? Mm-hmm. That's what it's for. Yeah. <laughs> Man, we sound like a yeah. Dummy. No, the, the res is the biggest place on the. That's just definitely the biggest tribe in the U.S. or the world or. Wherever. Yeah. How many people live on the on the reservation? I don't know. A lot. A lot. Do you like do you have a lot of people like from the reservation contact you, like asking, Hey Derek, what should I do with this? How should I do this? You did this. Like what do you think? Like do a lot of people come to you for advice or I mean, because, I mean you're highly respected <clears throat> in your community, obviously. Uh yes, they seems like I get asked quite a bit of on advice and there's Thousands of different 
advice you can give them. I hate it when they just say, I need some advice. Like, about what? <laughs> <laughs> like, I want to do what you do. And like, that's a, there's all different kinds of advice of what you can tell someone or stuff like that. But I don't know. I, I never, you know, my family never grew up like I was, my dad was never the po- positive person. He was never like, you can do it or you'll do good. Or like he was, he was more like kind of more the honest type or more the strict kind of like fall down, hit your head, almost like do it again kind of. Yeah. He was. He was pretty harsh. He was. Yeah. In a good way. In a good way. I mean, uh, he was pretty harsh, but. To look back at it now, I know why, because I think he wanted the best for me. So I think that's why he was like that. When you told your dad you wanted to do it, I mean, what was his response? You're like, okay. Because you're in rodeo too, right? Yeah, I never told him I was going to do it. You just went? I just went. You're more like, here, I'll just show you, and then you Mm -hmm. you don't have to tell me what you think? No, I didn't tell him that either. I just, like I said, we didn't have a plan. I was just going, and I never told him, like, hey, I want to, I never told him, like, I want to make the finals, or I never told him, like, I never told any of my hopes and dreams or nothing like that, which, you know, I never grew up really having no goals or no, I always just wanted to be a professional team roper. You know, that guy that's walking over there with the sponsor shirt and the starch jeans and a nice hat and riding a good horse. And I just wanted to be like that guy. That's it. So like, like world champion wise or wanted to win this or that really never was the reason why. I just wanted to be a professional roper. <laughs> so, but, yeah, my dad, he was still to this day still that way. Really? Yeah, he's, I think one of his favorite sayings one is like, uh, he's kind of like, I don't know if you've got a bad attitude or acting grumpy or something like that and don't want to feed the steers. Or, he's kind of the guy who will like, He'll just say, like, well, if you can't handle it, don't do it. Then he he knows I ain't going to quit. So that's a real tricky. You can't just say that to anyone. So that when he used to say, like, if you can't do it, quit. Or if you can't handle it, don't do it. (laughs) That used to make me mad. Make me mad. And he knew it, too. Like, he knew what to say at the right time, the right place. And he never was like, oh, you'll be okay. You're you'll be all right. This just take a break. You'll be, he, nope. <laughs> you can't handle it. Don't do it. Like, God dang it. And just make me mad and make you want to do make it. Make me want to do it. Yeah. Like stuff like he was kind of that guy. And so I was, he was positive in a negative way. If that makes any sense, <laughs> that's kind of how he was. And so I never grew up with the, all the, positive quotes and all that stuff. I never grew up really around that. <laughs> Is that how most of the, like the fathers are on the reservation? Or they I don't know. I think they need to like be. That? Yeah. I think there's, I mean, I think you have to have the love for your kid, but then I think you also have to have the honest truth about it too. Also. And that's probably what I'm going to have to deal with someday, but I don't know if I can do it. Yeah. I mean, what do you think you're going to be like with your daughter? I don't your daughter's know. like, Dad, I want to. I want to be a professional barrel racer. What are you gonna tell her? I bet you're gonna sell every one of them damn cows and get her a barrel <laughs> horse, aren't you? I. That's. I don't know. I'm gonna cross that road someday and find out. I don't know what I'm gonna be like. Right now, it's pretty hard to say no to anything she's doing. Yeah, I mean, if it's a one year old, she's not gonna listen anyway. Yeah, she can do yep. what she wants. Mm-hmm. It's kind of fun sitting here thinking back about all the. Times I've had or growing up or the memories I had in the sport, pretty good. Pretty amazing. I mean, uh, I think there's a lot of ropers who would trade places with you in a heartbeat to have, you know, eight trips to the national finals rodeo. A lot of guys who started way ahead, too, would, would love to have that story. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> tell you what, it's, it was, it sure wasn't easy. Yeah. You, you have to really love it. I do know that. I think that's, I guess going back to advice, that's probably the best I can give you is whatever you do, you better love it because 
there's more hard times than there is good. When you, especially rodeo, and you'll lose way more than you'll win. And it's hard going into something like that, knowing that's going to happen. Like, well, I guess this is where the love part takes over. It's different than a lot of sports, right? Because there's guarantees in every other sport except for rodeo. Yeah. You're paying. You're paying to do it. I'm paying to do it. That's right. So, and it's like, hey, Derek, I know you're a good roper, but give me all your money just so you have a shot at this money. I mean, I don't know if a lot of people who aren't in the sport realize, like, you got to pay to win in rodeo. So it, it's a big commitment. Especially when you say it the way you say it. It's a big commitment. Yeah, it is. It thanks for a big letdown, too. <laughs> I mean, there's... That's the hardest part about it. I mean, putting all you got into it and practicing as much as you can and go there and not go the way you want. It's hard to build back up and try it on the next one again. Yeah. But <laughs> I guess we all live for that winning feeling, though. That's what we're addicted to. People, people want to do great things. Don't you think like deep down people really want to do great things. It's just very few people actually can stomach the hard times. Yeah, I think that's what it is. That's what it is. I guess in my case, I think that's what it was. I mean, I, I've never done drugs before, but I think rodeo could be considered a drug. I mean, we drive all night and that's the low part of rodeo and Drive all night, 12, 16 hours just to get that. For three and a half to six seconds of of that natural dopamine. that yeah. natural high. I think that's why we do it. We ride that high for a while and being sure to pick at our skin on the low. <laughs> <laughs> and just for that high again, I think that's, I think that's how drugs work. But that, yeah, I don't know. I mean. But, yeah, yeah. I think that's the reason why I think I did it. Just, just because of that winning addiction and just the love of the sport. You have to love every bit of it. Like the traveling. Don't love that no more. That's why I'm not going so much. It was pretty exciting, probably. Like, you'd never left your home and you could see all these different places. I mean, you get to go to historical places like Cheyenne and Pendleton and you name it. Yeah. And you just get to see these larger than life places like history you just feel it when you go to those places yep yeah i'm getting older every year we're all getting older every year and what was that the semifinals last night in fort worth had to catch the steer to make it to the american today and that that feeling never gets old that was the most i think in my whole career last night was the most nervous i've ever been really yeah that was the last team I had to ca- just catch, not break the barrier and catch the steer to make it to the American today. Yeah, last night was the most nervous, nervous I've been. But just like that, like a guy like myself is being old and being, being through a lot like rodeo wise. I shouldn't have probably been as nervous as I was last night, but it felt like it was my first rodeo. <laughs> yeah. But caught the steer and still on that high right now yeah a couple more days well, one anyway yeah hopefully two yep put the good vibes out there right <clears throat> yep we'll see that's that's the fun part about roading is you don't know what's gonna happen you dang sure just better enter and give it your best and you never know they gotta pay someone might as well be you that's the fun part about it. Well, we better let you go get your game face on and get ready for the evening. Yeah, one of your buddies is asleep on the couch. He's getting his he's getting his rest. <laughs> Look, don't act like you haven't fallen asleep on that couch too. Well, I mean That is a comfortable couch. Just it is. It, it ain't the first time that surprised somebody fell asleep when I was talking. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of insulting, isn't it? Uh, I thought well, you said they were your friends. No, I'm I mean he's I've been in the truck with him a little bit, so he's probably heard the stories that I have, but there was a few stories in there that nobody knew about or nobody told. And He still doesn't know. Peyton's asleep. Yeah. Well, good. He don't, he'll, hopefully he'll listen. <laughs> hopefully he's not driving when he's listening to this podcast. We don't want him to fall asleep. Twice. That would be a tragic headline. 
<laughs> Team Roper dies too soon listening to the same story. You already fell asleep on once. <laughs> It'd be a good headline. Uh, dang. But yeah, these guys, they gave me a ride over here. And as I just flew back the other day. And yeah. So it's nice to be out here, though. Glad I made it. Yeah. Come to uh, two weeks earlier, and you would have not have wanted to be out here. It yeah, was a heard. mess. We're still fixing plumbing at our place. Yeah, I've heard. I heard it was pretty cold here, but glad I made it. It's nice to finally be in here and be part of it. I agree. I just, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you came, and we finally got to talk, and uh, just, I, I appreciate you coming by. Just listen a lot, and I don't I don't think I ever watched the, the video on it, but I listened a lot and just can't kind of imagine what it is in here like. It's, it's pretty neat. You like it in here? I'm glad yeah, you like it. I like it in here. I think you did pretty good. What needed, do you think, Ty? You think you did a good job? Needed some to needed some to drink, but <laughs> there was you were offered any number of well, drinks. Well, I didn't know I was gonna be sitting here this long. <laughs> you could have asked Ty for a drink any point, and he would have need a, graciously got you that. Red or Bull. Riley would have. You want a Red Bull? Those water? guys couldn't Bull. have got you a drink because they were drinking their own drool while they were sleeping. But they're gonna be refreshed at least. Something to drink. Yeah. Well, there's plenty of stuff to drink. All right. <laughs> well, I'm glad you came by. Look forward to watching tonight and uh, grab you a drink on the way out. This has been The Gage, hosted by me, Chance Conrado, produced and edited by our guy Ty Yeager. Shout out to the executive producers, Dustin Pointer and Cody Denton. Marketing and content produced by Riley Chone. Our theme song is by Shea Ashire and the Night Howlers. Make sure to rate and review this podcast as well as follow The Gauge on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And make sure to subscribe to The Gauge wherever you get your podcasts. We'll see you guys next time.